August 26, 2001, was cool and bright in Australia. A Sunday. As the last of the weekend slipped away, far off our northwest coast, out on the Indian Ocean, a fishing boat was about to sink. The engine blew, the boat flooded, fish swam across the decks. Then, far off on the horizon, a dot. A Norwegian ship that had answered a call from Australian rescue. The ship's crew watched in amazement as out of the little boat came 433 refugees. They told their rescuers to take them to Christmas Island or they would go crazy. When the captain changed course, the Australians radioed and threatened to seize his ship and put him in prison. The order had come from the very top. This ship, the Tampa, would not be allowed to land. We will decide who comes to this country and the circumstances in which they come. That night triggered one of the most dramatic moments in our history, when Australia stopped the boats. The Australian people didn't want their government to look as though it was being pushed around. Rarely have we felt so strongly about our politics, but rarely have we known so little about what was actually happening out on the ocean. The Australian public knew what they were told and what they were allowed to see. This is the story told by the men and women who were there. Our job was to go out there and stop any immediate threat to our country. I mean, what is a sovereign government if you can't decide who's going to come in and who's not? It's the story of one of the most famous victories in Australian politics. Oh, it's total chaos, and in this chaos there was opportunity. Was it completely transformed John Howard into some kind of combination of Rambo and Churchill? But this is more than a story about politics. It's also about us. About the old dance of democracy between the people and our leaders. And its enduring puzzle. Who is leading? and who is following. Just a year before the Tampa sailed into our history, Australia offered the world a picture of who we are. In 1940, Australia opened its arms to refugees, many of them fleeing oppression and poverty. And what it did was transform Australia into the multicultural society we have today. In the middle of the Olympic Stadium, the dancers formed the shape of our island coastline, 35,000 kilometres long, utterly undefendable. And then they threw out their arms, inviting others to come. Elsewhere, behind razor wire, in remote detention facilities, Australia's most recent wave of refugees looked on. Like those who had come before, many were fleeing. The Taliban in Afghanistan, Saddam Hussein in Iraq. But these people hadn't been chosen for a refugee visa. They had just come by boat. The image of the boats hit a nerve. Australia was not used to seeing many people turn up like this. In letters to the editor, on talkback radio, and in quiet conversations, we voiced our thoughts. Do we want to share our much-loved Australia with the huddled masses? Now the trickle, soon the flood. A huge land, empty and stable, beckons. Would any of us leave our homes and risk our lives unless we were genuinely in fear? Any rich country that allows poor people to arrive in whatever numbers they please will not be rich for long. Well, we can't erect a wall around ourselves and not be affected by the world. How many more are coming? What about the ones who land unnoticed? The question for our leaders was this. 
Should they hush these fears or give them voice? It's always been a powerful image in Australia. From the sea, the threats will come. You do have to be cautious uh, about how you express those things. I was never afraid to have this debate. People want governments to represent them occasionally <clears throat> uh, and, and to actually express how they feel and providing their feelings are honourable, governments should try and express community feeling. I understood absolutely from the beginning that there, were, there was a potential here for this to go haywire. Two thousand and one was an election year. All over the country, a small army was at work. The researchers from the major political parties who study the Australian people. You're listening for intensity. Every now and then, in focus groups, you get you get the words that you know can enter the political debate. If they're going to come here illegally, what will they do after they get here? You hear it, and you know that will work for a politician. If only there were a way to put these illegal immigrants back to the end of the queue. I don't like illegal immigrants coming here and queue jumping. The rest of the world must think Australia is a very easy touch. We are not an easy touch. But some basic facts were being left out of the loop. In Afghanistan or Iraq, there was no Australian embassy. The idea of a queue was a fantasy. And the people on the boats were not illegals. Australia's laws gave them the right to seek asylum here. And then there was the most basic fact of all, the numbers. In defence, it wasn't a big deal, because these numbers of people were very, very small, and that's why they didn't represent a security threat. Uh, we don't actually remember that most of our illegal immigration takes place at our airports. No, it was the new story of the, of the particular you know, time that we were in and can drive anything to hysteria by beating it up enough. As many as 10,000 people could be packing up now in the Middle East with a view to trying to access Australia. It is so I'm told... In the Liberal Party, in the lead-up to election, they were speaking about a lot. And, uh, you know, a lot of them were saying this, I think, could be very helpful to us. Yeah, I think it has to be described as a moral panic. There was a lot of discussion and disquiet within the Labor Party, but the view of those who were inclined, I suppose, to think the worst of the Australian community and that it wasn't capable of persuading them uh, held sway. Policies in the area of immigration are best settled on a bipartisan basis. Labor offered not opposition, but an echo, as the government escalated its offensive. The laws were tightened. The protection we offered was slashed. More people were locked up. We cannot run our country on the basis that people who come here illegally in defiance of the laws and queue jumping on others who patiently wait their turn. But having joined the atmosphere of crisis, the government found itself in a corner because nothing it did could make the boat stop. But the strategies on... are not working, are they? Well, um, when you say the strategies are not working, um, what is the alternative? The only alternative strategy I hear is using our armed forces to stop the people coming and turning them back. We don't turn people back into the sea. We can't behave in that manner. It was becoming increasingly difficult to persuade the public that all that could be done was being done, but they still weren't happy. How long is our gutless government going to permit this? You implement a measure and you hope that it will contain it. These boats are not seaworthy and accidents are going to happen. And if it doesn't, you say, well, what more can we do? This is an invasion. It has to be stopped. I hoped that the problem would solve itself or disappear or remain containable or diminish. Well, it just kept, it kept going. Until that Sunday, August 26, 2001, when one boat finally stopped and the people on board were picked up by the Tampa. The Tampa was the beginning of the turning point. The only thing to do was to take a stand. The Tampa presented an opportunity. If an Australian ship had rescued them, these boat people would have just gone into detention in Australia. But here, a large Norwegian rabbit had appeared from the hat of the Indian Ocean. 
bringing for the first time the chance to say no. The captain of the Tampa had no idea of the political minefield he had sailed into. He'd rescued 433 people at Australia's request, only to be told he mustn't land them. So he waited just off Christmas Island for morning. I'm not uh, used to politics and uh, been in Siemens all my life and I'm not used to that. We don't like to be involved in the refugee problems. So that's why we call them only people we are rescued from the sea. Mr Speaker, the government has requested the Tampa not enter Australian territorial waters. When I was looking down from the bridge, the people was listening into a radio that smuggled on board. Whilst this is a humanitarian decent country, we are not a soft touch and we are not a nation whose sovereign rights in relation to who comes here are going to be trampled on. Yeah. And then I went on the hunger strike. The only man on board the ship who was really happy was the cook. The government's stand on the Tampa, a ship we saw only in fuzzy long lens images from the edge of a media no-go zone, met with one of the most extraordinary levels of support ever seen on any issue in Australian public life. At last, decisive action. Thank God the Australian government's at last got the guts to say enough is enough. We are a humane people. We just don't like being railroaded. Here are people escaping one of the worst regimes on earth and our government refuses assistance. We can't believe this is happening in Australia. So about 80% of us say we shouldn't let them in. Seems to me that there's no more debate needed. Isn't this how democracy is supposed to work? On the Tampa, things were getting messy. The refugees hadn't been in great shape when they were rescued, and now they'd spent two nights on the open deck of a cargo ship. Amongst them were three young Afghanis, a shopkeeper, a farmer, and a student. Lots of people were sick, and uh, one of them was really, really badly sick. He was very skinny, skinny boy, looking around 15, 16 years old, and he was fainted totally. Water coming out of his mouth, and his eyes were rolling and uh, getting dark, and he was in desperate need of, you know, some medical assistance. That was me. That was me, I was unconscious because I've been eating or drinking three days. We had 10 people unconscious going in and out of coma. That was the only thing I was asking for all the time, medical assistance. But nothing turns up. After three days without help, Rinan did something that in 40 years at sea, he'd never done before. He sent out a mayday signal. Still no help came. Now the Norwegian captain had had enough. We entered the Australian waters to get the reaction. The government's reaction was instant. The SAS is the shortest noticed, most highly capable in extremist force that the government has at disposal to apply to a counter-terrorist role. Peter Tinley was second in command of the SAS counter-terrorism squad. The mission was to board the Tampa and, on command, stop it. Just running towards us with the guns and saying that don't move, if anybody move we'll shoot. First time the soldier come up, they think we are terrorists and we were surrounded by them. So, and then we saw that they, they are on the top level as well with the guns. <laughs> I want to record that my gratitude to the men of the Australian Defence Force who were involved in this operation. When I talked to the guys when they came back off the, the boarding party, I said, how did you find the group? And they said, well, they're a bunch of refugees. It's always important on occasions like this to remember that the men and women of our Defence Force uh, are exposed to potential danger. I'm not sure if they had thought about the threat environment uh, in more depth that they couldn't have just sent a naval vessel there or sent a customs vessel if there was such a thing in the, in the area. 
but I can't help but feel that uh, the Prime Minister, John Howard, viewed the SAS as something that would resonate politically uh, to the message of border security. You can't amp it up more in the public's mind than saying, we're going to send in the SAS, we'll show you how tough we are on border security. This is a moving situation, the one which was difficult has now become... Again, Labor offered its support. And in these circumstances, this country and that this parliament does not need a carping opposition. As politicians, we have to be infinitely flexible. I don't admire uh, a, a stand on principle that is simply suicidal. What it actually needs is an opposition understanding a difficult circumstance. In which Kim is a man that I've known for a very long time and in many ways admire and like. But on this, I just think he was absolutely wrong. It was the most calculated uh, move by the government to scare the pants off Australians. Also, the bill provides authority for the ship to be taken outside the territorial sea. But the strategy of bipartisanship was torpedoed just hours later when John Howard produced new border protection laws. They were so broad that even for an opposition determined to stay in step, they couldn't be supported. For the first time, Labor offered opposition. That will be capable of being sustained by this bill. Drag it out sink it, people die. The Prime Minister will not be in it. We will not be in it. Our position in the polls collapsed overnight. The average citizen would not say, oh, well, we agree with Howard's decision, but we don't agree with the way he's implementing it. And the, all the average citizen wanted was a government to, to stop uh, the tamper coming. That's what the, the average citizen had worked out should be done. But what the average citizen probably didn't know was that out on the Tampa, no one was in control. The SAS could not get Rinan to move back out of Australian waters. We started to rattle around and say, well, can we get some naval people to come up here and drive the ship? But if we took this Norwegian flagged vessel and then decided to drive it into international waters by our own hand, is that not some form of piracy itself? No solution. No, I was not going anywhere. Canberra tried other governments looking for help. We haven't violated that international seafaring tradition. New Zealand offered to take some of the refugees, the families and the children. But that still left several hundred. There had to be another way out. The island of Nauru was a place that most Australians had never heard of. It was 4,000 kilometres from Sydney, the smallest republic in the world, a nation of just 12,000 people living on 21 square kilometres and an economy based around guano mining. The guano was running out and Nauru was on the verge of bankruptcy. It was colloquially known as Birdshed Island. Phone calls were made to Nauru's president, Rene Harris. The Prime Minister announced a solution. This is a real breakthrough. Nauru would process the refugees. It does give us the basis of handling the problem consistent with the assertion by Australia that our border integrity is not to be breached. Eight days after they'd been rescued, the refugees finally left the Tampa for an Australian Navy ship, HMAS Manura, bound for Nauru. But their passage was going to take some time. There was an issue in Australia's arrangements with Nauru. At the point at which the Manura took the people on board, there was no agreement at that stage with the Nauru government to take the refugees. No. How long could the Manura stay at sea with these people on board? I think, from memory, that to use a term, it loitered. It seemed around in circles, sort of, you know, waiting for a place to go. We were just down the bottom of the ship. We could not see anything. The only thing was that was coming into my mind that how long will it take and what, where is it going? The government needed to do a deal fast with Nauru's president, Rene Harris. The man they sent was Defence Minister Peter Reith. It was a question of, well, how are we going to look after Rene? And I'd said to John before I left, I said, well, I think we should just basically whatever they want. I mean. Even, even, even though people will say, oh, well, you were just sort of buying favours from them. 
I mean, the fact is, here's a group of people, you know, they're a bit down on their luck. My attitude was, well, why don't we just see what we can do to help them? And if they help us, that's good. Yeah, I was standing next to him when he rang out. And he said, $20 million, and OK, good. That was it, $20 million of taxpayers' money. Very beginning, we have said... Their determination to make things happen was working for the government. We're increasing the surveillance. We're, we've proposed a solution to the Tampa problem. Over the week of the Tampa, John Howard's approval ratings had rocketed 10 points. The government seized the moment. This would be the way forward. The line that had been drawn before... We don't turn people back into the sea. We can't behave in that manner. ..now shifted. From now on, the boats would be stopped. The government would send the Navy to turn them back in a new campaign called Operation Relics. The arrival of the boats had passed from an immigration issue into a defence issue. Admiral Chris Barry was the chief of the Defence Force. We were not enthusiastic about this. It's a wonderful thing to do. But when the decision is made, we execute the government's decision. You were able to, to, to board them, stop them, physically board them, check them out, you know, for seaworthiness, and, and then say, well, you know, go back to Indonesia. Only four days into Operation Relics, a boat sailed into view and the Navy prepared to repel it. The leaky boats were now called sieves, suspected illegal entry vessels. A boarding party went alongside Civ 1 and read out the declaration they'd been given. To master and crew, the Australian government is determined to stop illegal migration to its territory. You should now consider immediately returning to Indonesia and not enter Australia. From the 230-something people, I think one or two people understood what they actually said. The refugees nodded. The sailors returned to their ship and the fishing boat kept coming. There was no way we, we were going to turn around. No. I don't understand the whole concept of being turned around and going back home. The, well, there was no home to go back to. This was not the plan. Senior commanders sought further instructions from Canberra. But none came. Out on the ocean, they waited. There was still no plan about what to do next when Sibs 2 and 3 arrived, just days later. Well, none of them turned back. Uh, of course not. Why would they? Uh, so what do we do next? Uh, we didn't have a real answer. There's that period of just sitting there trying to keep control of this two or three hundred people. Looking after them is fine in these situations for a few hours and maybe a few days, but it certainly isn't a very satisfactory arrangement for a few weeks. Within a week of relics starting, the Navy had nearly a thousand refugees on their hands. Finally, a decision came from Canberra. These people, too, were bound for Birdshit Island. The Australian public knew very little about it. What the government was doing was trying to control very much what people saw, what they heard, what they were told. Jenny McHenry was the head of public affairs for the Department of Defence. Under her direction, the military regularly gave public briefings about its work. But for relics, the flow of information changed course. We were told quite clearly that all information was to come out of the Minister's office, that there were, there were to be no comments issued through public relations or through the Defence Department. I gather our people saw that as Peter Reith's office set specific requirements for the information that would be released. We were told that there was to be nothing in the public forum which would humanise these people. We were quite stunned. We, I think, had perceived that the line was going to be hard, but we didn't realise it was going to be that hard. They didn't want to have any kind of connection between our values and the values that these people may well have presented. Brigadier Gary Bornholt was the head of military public affairs. They wanted to portray that these were not normal people. Mm. 
the image of the people on the boats as something other than normal was about to come into sudden and terrible focus. Yeah, guys were whispering the yeah, commandos, and they once came to us and said, big things have happened in the world. And we said, what's that? He said, oh, I can't tell you exactly, but it's really big and it's bad. The date was September 11th. Normal was over. We looked across the Pacific with sympathy to America and across the Indian Ocean to the boats of Muslims still coming towards us. Who's next? Thousands of asylum seekers are heading for Australia. Are they what they claim to be? Well, there could be terrorists amongst them. When I saw them on television, they had a kind of anger in their faces. We don't want to risk allowing that hate to enter Australia. Don't people understand that the boat people are fleeing the bastards who did this? People who put their lives at risk to flee the evil people who did this should be welcome to Australia, not turned away. How many terrorists have already been planted amongst us? Wake up. This is a warning. Unless you have a careful screening process, you can't guarantee that people who come here illegally may not have terrorist links. It seemed to me to be a funny way to get to Australia if you were a terrorist. I mean, there, there are other easier ways to get into Australia than spent six months in the river somewhere like that. <laughs> Haven't travelled in a leaky boat. <laughs> in the weeks after September 11th, the government's polls continued to climb. John Howard called the election. This is a time, of course, to choose strength and purpose and stability over the alternative. It was as close as you can get to a khaki election. That's an election that's held during a war where incumbents are usually massively favoured um, and um, you know, fear, anxiety, hatred, anger tend to rule voting choices. The very evening that Howard called the election, the most talked about, most misunderstood and most significant of the leaky boats that came that spring set sail. Civ 4, the boat that came to be called the Children Overboard Boat. On board with her mother and brothers was 14-year-old Zainab Hassan. It was the first time she'd been on a boat. For us as young kids, like for me and my brother, it, was, it wasn't like scary. It was sometimes exciting yeah, to be on a boat. It was like a... Um, it was like a movie or <laughs> a cartoon, I don't know, yeah. Able seaman Beck Lind was on board HMAS Adelaide, which was about to confront Civ 4. On those vessels, we were told that a lot of these people were coming from possible terrorist countries and our job was to go out there and stop any immediate threat to our, to our country. And of course, we were well and truly prepared to do that. The Navy had so far failed to compel a single leaky boat to turn back. Now the captain of the Adelaide, Norman Banks, employed new tactics. The Adelaide fired 23 rounds across Civ 4's bow. The refugees matched the escalation instantly. A dozen people threw themselves overboard. Fearing that the whole lot would jump, Banks sent a boarding party to bring the situation under control. The ship's camera caught a rough image of the exchange. When the boarding party came back on board, they were talking about how some people had jumped into the water and that another guy, you know, held up his child and saying, look, we've got, we've got our family on board, we've got children on board. We didn't know the language and this was the only way to communicate to these people. So he was holding his child to tell them, like, look, we have children, like, if you don't care about me, care about my child. In the middle of these events, Captain Banks received a phone call from his commander in Darwin. Wires got crossed. Later, Banks insisted he said adults were throwing themselves overboard. 
His commander was just as certain he'd been told they were throwing their children into the water. And so one of the silliest and nastiest games of Chinese whispers in history began. A number of children have been thrown overboard. I don't want in Australia people who would throw their own children into the sea. I mean, that is appalling, throwing kids overboard. There's something to me incompatible between somebody who claims to be a refugee and somebody who would throw their own child into the sea. I imagine the sorts of uh, children who would be thrown would be those who could be readily lifted and tossed without, uh, without any objection from them. <laughs> This perfectly fitted the message. Previously, the government didn't want an image of people who are in difficulty because we all sympathise with them. What it now has is an image of people who are not wanted at all. This is not what Australians do. So they've got no chance of getting in here. As we struggle to absorb the scenario of children lobbed overboard, out on the ocean, the real drama was about to unfold. The Navy was still dealing with Civ 4. Like Civs 1, 2 and 3 before, they would not turn back. And so again, the question was, what next? While senior Navy commanders argued with Canberra about where exactly it should be taken, the Adelaide was instructed to take the boat under tow. Towing a vessel can be quite dangerous and towing an unseaworthy vessel can cause it to break up. And then there were the people on board, the unauthorised boat arrivals, or UBAs as they were called. Some of them were systematically wrecking the boat. All this was being closely followed from Canberra. The UBAs had thrown overboard themselves, their children, their navigation equipment, that disabled the steering and the pumps. So she was taking water, but our replacement pumps were keeping the boat afloat. But Civ 4 continued to take on water. We could see the water like coming up and up. If that had been the Manly Ferry in Sydney Harbour, we would have rushed over there and got everyone off as quickly as possible. But we were to do whatever we could to avoid these people entering Australian territory. And that would mean if they came onto the boat, then they're in Australian territory. Even with part of the boat visibly sinking, the orders from Canberra remained unchanged. Situation is under control. Several remains partially afloat, submerged to the upper structure, superstructure. Photographs taken from the deck of the Adelaide tell what happened next. The captain and the crew of the Adelaide did what no sailor would ever want to do waited and watched until Civ 4 actually sank. Then, and only then, could they rescue these people. The sea was just littered with people everywhere. There were people jumping off the vessel, and there were people clambering into the life rafts. Me and like my mum and my brothers were some of the last people who jumped to the water. Next I heard was that the boat had sunk and they were all in the water. The crew that had fired its guns at them now threw themselves into rescuing the refugees. I remember Laura Whittle jumping off the bridge wing onto, into the water to swim out. I remember thinking she was slightly crazy for jumping off there. It was a huge relief to hear an hour or so later, that there'd been no loss of life. Um, it was a worrying time. It was one of the biggest maritime rescues in Australian history. It's almost what I joined the Navy to do, to be part of, of that sort of thing. I certainly had an overwhelming sense of, these were humans, they're, they're not dogs, they're not animals. For me personally, that was sort of a, a turning point. My attitude changed, definitely, and a lot of people's did. Captain Banks was so proud that later that night he emailed pictures of the rescue to his superiors in the Navy. The pictures did not stay private for long. Back home, the Adelaide was already big news and the media were demanding pictures, not of the rescue, but from the day before. 
when children, so the hottest story in the country went, had been thrown overboard. These two events, one real, one imagined, now became confused, and the pictures took on a life of their own. I just looked at them and said, well, OK, people in the water, they're from the defence, release them. I didn't have a view about what, what they proved or didn't prove. In fact, I didn't think they proved much anyway. Now joining us in the studio is the Defence Minister, Peter Reith. Welcome back to The Drive program. Thank you very much. You've got some photos to show this, have you? Well, it did happen. Uh, the fact is the children were thrown into the water. There's nothing in this photo that indicates these people either jumped or were thrown. Well, you're now questioning uh, the veracity of reports from the Royal Australian Navy. I don't. It's as clear as day. I called Peter Reith's media advisor to say I can definitely confirm that those photographs do not portray what the government has said about people being thrown in the water. He didn't take the call, it went through to his voicemail. This would be the only voicemail that I can ever recall leaving for him, I used to leave a number, that he never received. But you, you so do you still question that? I'm well, do you? I'm a journalist, I'll question anything well, until I get well, the proof. That's, well, I've, that's just my job. I've just given you the evidence. Some people in Australia probably wanted to see that image or have that image. We are told that people have been thrown in the water. So yes, OK, here is a picture which shows children in the water. It reinforces what I was told. If I want to believe that. What kind of values do people have who are willing to put the lives of their children at risk? If these so-called refugees are capable of throwing their own children overboard, what are they capable of doing to other human beings? What kind of parents throw their children into shark-infested seas? If I were as desperate as the parents on these boats, I would have thrown my children into the water to be picked up and given a better life. We shouldn't condemn all asylum seekers. Only a very small number of people jumped overboard with their children. I don't care whether people were pushed into the sea or thrown. We don't want them. And what about the people in that picture? <laughs> it's my mum and my brother, my little brother, and the lady that helped them. It's not a happy moment, I think. Reminding me of what happened back then. And actually I don't like to I don't like the sea anymore, so I don't like to see the sea here. The crew of the Adelaide had no contact with the outside world during these days. Their captain called them together. We thought that when we returned to Australia that we'd be getting a pat on the back for a job well done. But um, the captain told us that some photos that had been sent from the ship had been misinterpreted. And from that came a story that the people that we had rescued had thrown some of their children overboard. He said that it was absolutely obviously not true, but we were distinctly told not to talk to the media. We were told to filter what we were to say to our families and that sort of thing. It was a kick in the guts. It was it sort of made us feel like we just rescued a pack of dogs. Back in Canberra, the truth was no secret. I think the fact that in all likelihood, no children had been thrown overboard it was widely known. I know that the Maritime Command believed that. Uh, I'm fairly sure that I'd be right in saying that the Northern Command believed that. And I'm fairly sure that I'd be right in saying that all of that had permeated upwards and the people in Public Affairs and Strategic Command in Canberra knew that. It's all confusion, is what I've written. <laughs> And now everyone is trying to cover their backside. We had the photos issued on the understanding that they were right. I checked with CDF, but now he's not sure if he had had the same photos I had. It's difficult to give somebody like Peter Reith, when he's in full flight, advice about something he doesn't want to hear. Given the political importance that the government was putting on the whole children overboard, Tampa, border protection stuff, there was a reluctance to bring unwelcome news forward to the government on this issue. This is a highly colourful and highly charged image that we're being presented with. 
you can't turn around two days later or three days later or a week later and say, um, oh, well, that wasn't actually true uh, because it then brings into play, well, maybe all the other stuff wasn't true. Maybe the Tampa people weren't as bad as we thought they were. Um, maybe this is not about security. Maybe this is about politics. Maybe it is. Zainab, her mother and younger brothers and all the others rescued by the Adelaide were headed for Australia's Pacific solution. Detention on Nauru and Manus Island in Papua New Guinea. When I made it to Nauru, I was thinking, oh, I have to kiss this soil. It's, it's amazing, I can see soil now, you know? I can't like, forget that moment. When we got off the bus, I came outside and I said, where are we going from here? I was thinking there's another bus coming to take us to the facilities. There was this shed and it wasn't enough for 200 people, so we had our mattresses on the, the, on the ground and we slept outside. After the first two weeks that we were there, there was no journalists all of a sudden, everyone was cut off. Kind of felt that we'd been cast away. Actually, we feel that we are not in the world anymore. We're somewhere that, that, that nobody had any idea. Back in Australia, the hard realities of the Pacific solution, like Operation Relics, remained far from view. Voters weren't looking for detail. What they were looking for was a sense that the Prime Minister was on their side and taking as tough a measures as possible. I don't think they understood too much about it. I don't think they cared as long as they weren't coming to Australia. And, you know, I was certainly told in no uncertain way uh, that, uh, you know, it was not an area I should get into. The election was three weeks away. And behind the popular promises, the camps of the Pacific Solution were already filling up. Because Relex was not achieving its objective. Not a single boat had been turned back. The government's response? Escalate Relex. From now on, instead of simply trying to turn boats out of Australian waters, the Navy would board them and sail them all the way back to Indonesia. Word quickly spread that the game had changed. For the refugees, if there was no way back, they too had to take up new tactics and force a way through. Many people heard when we was in Indonesia, and they say it's, uh, uh, we have uh, to throw the children because the boat before the, they do it, they throw children to the water, and the navy accept them. My dad got me because, like, he they wouldn't let us to go to Australia, so he's like, oh, let's make a joke, cause, like, so they can take us to it. He got me and he's like, we're going to throw our children in the water if you don't take us. <laughs> I'm just my daughter, like, move, just in, inside. <laughs> well, he picked me up and um, acted, like. acted like he was going to throw me in the water. And I said, Muhammad, my daughter, my daughter, leave yeah. her, she's died. <laughs> But police quickly open uh, catch him. Catch me, yeah. This way we, we want to escape the navy. Uh, we do that. The circumstance that we're actually creating by this turnaround policy suits the electorate but it puts all of our own people directly into harm's way. That's what we're doing. The public doesn't grasp the severity of the situation that those potential immigrants find themselves in. The things that they did, you would say that same people wouldn't do. It also becomes more dangerous because the policy to turn boats around is a good policy as long as you've got a boat. What we're creating is a potential 
high risk situation where it's in the interests of the people on the boat to sink the boat. People were worried that things sooner or later would go very badly. The Navy's concerns were relayed up the line to Canberra. The standing orders for relics remained unchanged. One boat did not get close enough to be confronted. This boat is known not by a number, but by a letter. Civ X. The night after it left Indonesia, a storm hit the boat. The engine died, and in rising seas, it began to take on water. Civ X sank. 353 people drowned. Civex was a terrible tragedy. Terrible, it was heartbreaking, all those little children. But, uh, I mean, if, if, if we send the message, don't try it in the first place, because you're not going to succeed, then maybe no more Civexes would set out in the first place. That's really what I'm saying. But whatever our sympathies, stronger feelings took centre stage. The Prime Minister of Australia, John Howard. Just days later came the line that defined this moment in our history. We will decide who comes to this country and the circumstances in which they come. It wasn't a scripted line, it just came to me. And that is really what the Australian people believed. And because it captured the mood of the public, it resonated. Other facts had little public resonance. None of the leaky boats would turn back. Attempts to sail them back were meeting with increasing violence and often had to be abandoned. And people were just piling up on Nauru and Manus Island. And what we still didn't know, the children had not been thrown overboard. In the Navy, frustration built. Rumours began to seep out. You know, we'd been through a major event. You need somebody to talk to other than just your shipmates, so everyone talked to their families about it, whether we were told to or not. Just three days before the election, the boiler burst. The story, citing disgruntled sailors, hit the front pages. The children overboard incident had never happened. In Canberra, a scramble was on for the truth. With Gary Bornholt as a witness, Acting Chief of the Defence Force, Angus Houston, had the plainest conversation he could with Peter Reith. He explained the entire sequence of events, the chronology they had in front of them, and the fact that this was an error. Mike Scrafton had conversations with John Howard. I spoke to the Prime Minister, explained to him that most people in defence didn't think that the children overboard issue had actually happened. I have absolutely no recollection of him saying that. This is a severe embarrassment to John Howard and a dent to his credibility. Well, in my mind, there is no uncertainty because I don't disbelieve the advice I was given by defence. Mr Rees blaming the Navy. I have faithfully said publicly what I've been told at the time. On the other side of the country, the Chief of the Navy gave his version. It doesn't appear that they were thrown in, and that child ultimately went into the water when the boat sank, and it was rescued and brought on board the Adelaide. Within an hour, Jenny McHenry was telephoned by Peter Reith's office and directed to draft a retraction for the Chief. I felt very much sucked into the process. I, I've seen a wire report of what he said. So have I. I've got it. Yeah, 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 but he... I saw on the TV later that night John Howard waving it around, basically saying, well, you know, we were advised. And uh, I felt quite sick in the stomach, actually. But perhaps the most striking thing about the controversy was our reaction to it. The government standing in the polls didn't slip. It rose. In logic, you would say that a revelation of government chicanery would uh, put the government on the back foot but it brought back into the campaign their issue. Well, well people are wondering too no, if no, the, the government Cas information has been right, and I guess that's what I'm asking no, no, you, I think, whether I think, you stand by it and is it right. I think they're wondering uh, who really does uh, intend, if they get elected on Saturday, to maintain a firm policy on illegal arrivals. So it could be a hostile story, but if people are talking about it and it's your issue, 
you will make gains. And that's what happened in the last two days of the 2001 election. While these strange politics played themselves out, far off our coast, the last boat to come before the election puttered into view. The escalation of relics was about to reach its dreaded logical outcome. The boarding party could see something was wrong straight away. They climbed over and found smoke coming out of the hold. Seconds later, the engine exploded. If you're going back to watch, you can see more than 160 people inside the water, including one week baby born, and an old woman, an old man. And most people said, God, oh my God, I'm going to die. And during the sunset, they catch me up from the water. One of the soldiers said, a lady died. She's a young woman, and she was. Sorry. She was next to me, and she was pregnant. Both sides had escalated their struggle. Now two women were dead. Two days later, we cast our votes and gave John Howard his most famous election victory. The week before the tamper arrived, polls had predicted a loss. 10 weeks later, the Prime Minister had an increased majority. There were some surprising results amongst the 190 seats won that night. For two vocal critics of Australia's stand on the boats, strong swings towards them. My experience with Australians, if you actually explain the position, they do get it. You've got to be willing to take a bit of a risk to do that, but I think if you scraped away the opinion polling, you wouldn't find our leaders afraid of Australians more likely they know how they can manipulate them. I don't think that comes from fear. It comes from something closer to contempt. After the election, two more sieves came. And then the leaky boats suddenly just stopped. There were many reasons. The Taliban fell in Afghanistan, so the numbers of people trying to flee suddenly dropped. Indonesia began to crack down on the trade from its end. But it is also the case that Operation Relics and the Pacific Solution worked. We had come upon a solution, a foolproof way of uh, preventing boats coming. And the fact that it did was stunning, the success of it. But the successes or failures of that solution are things that perhaps only later generations can measure. We stopped the boats, but did that ease our fears or entrench them? With time, of course, the boats have returned. Our sense of how to deal with them is as troubled as ever. Our national reflex is a temptation to regard the problem as a crisis as our leaders well know. In the end, of the people who came on boats in the spring of 2001, 70% were found to be genuine refugees. Today, the majority of them are living in Australia. People we spent hundreds of millions of dollars and the energies of our armed forces to stop. There are 700 of them. For me, Australia is now my country. I love it, and I tell everyone that. Like, I, I'm, I never think of going back because 
I found my life here. Our kids probably will Aussie, Aussie, Aussie all the way. I just graduated from Melbourne University doing engineering and science. And at the moment looking for work and trying to figure out the next step in my life. I just finished my Bachelor of Art degree and I'm doing my Diploma of Education now. And hopefully I'm going to be a teacher. Now that they're Australians too, how do they see the rest of us? How do they explain what happened in the spring of 2001? After I came to Australia, I hear people's opinion, different opinions, and I think people didn't agree with that. There's nothing wrong with Australia. There's nothing wrong with the people. We are not blaming the Australian, beautiful Australian people. We love them and we respect them. Most of them are really nice people, especially when you get to know them.